Welcome to the Virtual Physiatry Mentors. I'm Dr. Sheena Buba. I'm Dr. Benicia Williams. And together we are Shanisha. Shanisha. <laughs> okay, not bad, not right. bad. Okay. Not bad, yep. Well, today we have our very good friend, Dr. Carol Lee. I actually know um, Carol from high school. We went to high school together and we were on the academic decathlon team together. <laughs> we were B students. Can you imagine? Yeah. We were. <laughs> quote, quote, B students, which I don't know. Okay, but we don't know age, but yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> we could go both ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, Dr. Lee is going to talk to us about inpatient rehab and what it's like actually practicing in the real world. We'll compare um, how it is, you know, with residency versus when you're out on your own and kind of managing those expectations. So super excited. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. And the fun thing about team and R and rehab is there's so many levels because it's such a small field. We're Jane and I's lives are like this because Carol Train, which she's going to tell us a little bit more about with one of my best friends who I did my master's with and re- medical school with, and she did residency with. So, and then she, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of layers, but, um, which is fun <laughs> because it's like a reunion every time you get to see each other. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, tell you. us a little bit more about yourself. Tell us where you trained, undergrad and all that stuff. Yeah, no, thank you, first of all, for having me on. Um, it's a pleasure. It's fun to see you guys, as usual. Um, I initially uh, went to undergrad at UC Berkeley in California. Um, My brother went to Berkeley. Uh, I don't, I didn't know, if you, you know, I grew up like 25 minutes away from Berkeley. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. I mean, really? You never Berkeley. got to that point of chatting yeah. about that. Oh, yeah. okay. That's why I got my name. I'm named after the Small city. World. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nice. Sorry, level. No, no. Um, I just wanted to get out of Texas a little bit and kind of, you know, do something a little different and maybe grow up on my own. That's why I chose California. Um, it was very expensive. So I had to cut that short and graduated in um, December 2017. But I had wanted to go into medicine. So, um, you know, being pre med and everything, um, I definitely took the courses necessary, but I did take some time before actually entering and applying for medical school. So um, Sheena knows this, but I did um, a 10 month uh, period of AmeriCorps and I stayed in San Francisco after graduation um, and worked with the American Red Cross and did basically their disaster preparedness program, um, specifically targeting the Asian American community because you know they don't like to prepare for disasters. The mentality <laughs> is pretty much that if a disaster happens, we'll just go down with it. <laughs> so that was an interesting experience. I worked with youth groups um, during that time. So it was a, it was a good, it was a fun experience to, to learn to teach and also to work with, you know, a community that I cared about. So after that was over, I, you know, of course, during that time applied for medical school and um, got into San Antonio's program. So that's where I ended up. Um, I did also interview at TCOM, and so it was really between the two for me, um, but as fate has it, I chose San Antonio, and that's where I eventually met my husband as well, so trained here um, for four years, liked it, you know, and really got to know, and once I decided about, you know, going into pm which really, I think I have to owe some of that to, to Sheena here, because she was the one that introduced me to that field first, when she told me about rehab, I hadn't really heard about it, <laughs> um, And so I did some rotations with our program in San Antonio, really liked the uh, residents here. I I liked the program design, that it was categorical. Um, And I felt like the faculty that we had was also incredibly stellar. So I ended up choosing San Antonio um, as one of my top choices, although applying to several different programs in in the country. Um, Luckily, I was able to match here and did my four years of residency in San Antonio. Um, still haven't given up on San Antonio, so I'm still here <laughs> after completion. Despite me trying my best to get you up to North Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> I yes, I did consider it, but you know, my husband's here and you know, we, we ended up buying a house in San Antonio. So I think we're here for the long run. Um, and you know, San Antonio grows on you. I think initially when I tell people about San Antonio, it's not very exciting. It's not like Dallas. It's not um, you know, 
very culturally diverse, like Houston in a way, um, and or you know, cool or interesting like Austin. But I think San Antonio is a is a great like well paced city for me. <laughs> it's chill. It's got a great community. Um, very friendly people. No traffic. So we like it here. That's a plus. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of, um, you know, senior residents and even early attendings watching. And um, I think it'd be nice to hear, especially for the PGY3s and PGY4s, kind of when did you start, you know, deciding that you wanted to do inpatient rehab? When did you start looking for a job? And how did all that come about? Yeah. So um, first I had to think about, I mean, pretty much it was a no brainer where I was going to be. You know, we decided San Antonio was our home. Um, so I think for many residents graduating, you have to think about where you want to be first. So geography is really important. But luckily for me, I really just focused on San Antonio. And so once I decided that, I knew that I wanted to do, um, I've always had an interest in brain injury, neuro rehab, but I wanted to, when I first coming out of residency, I wanted to sort of maintain a lot of my, um, my skills in managing a diverse um, uh you know, rehab cases. And so I chose to do general rehab and I felt like the best way to really do that was to be an inpatient. Um, I also felt most comfortable in inpatient. I felt like our program really prepared us for the setting. And so that was another reason why I was chasing after those opportunities the most. And so talking to some past alums um, and just people in, in, in the city, I, I knew that there were, you know, a couple spots open. Um, I, I worked, I ended up working with Warm Springs um, and then I did also look at some other hospital systems uh, to, to see if that would be a possibility. But definitely around the, I would say September, October was when I started talking to some of those hospitals. Um, and then really around December was when I tried to finalize things um, with uh, Warm Springs and Post Acute. Um, and then by January and February, that's when, you know, contract negotiations were all pretty much completed and I signed. Um, so. I felt like you needed to do that early on in your fourth year because um, you have to have your medical license. First of all, in Texas, medical license takes about six months or so to get. Mm -hmm. um, so to get on board, you have to have that basically, you know, in the works um, and to get credential license and everything that all takes time. And so it's definitely um, one of the reasons why I wanted to have a job sort of in place by January, February, so that a lot of this stuff can be rolling in before you know I officially started with them. Um, the great thing about this job was that when I first started, you know, um, I really wanted time to prepare for boards, so um, they were able to give me a start time after I took the oh, nice. board. So that was kind of nice to have that study period. Um, so. They were flexible with that, um, and you know, starting in inpatient, I was very lucky to be with my colleagues. Um, one of my co-residents was our chief resident, um, also was in the group. Um, one of our old alums was in there as well, and then eventually, um, we also had another old attending that you know used to be in our program join our group as well. And so I was surrounded by stellar PM&R colleagues to really kind of help me grow and, and, and continue um, in, in the practice. So it was, it was a really great experience, I think, overall. But um, I think another great resource to look for jobs um, would be, I mean, I still attended the AAPMR conference. Um, and you know that newsletter that you get once a month from AAPMNR, they actually post jobs on there as well. And I've mm -hmm. seen jobs for local, like in Texas and San Antonio even being posted on there. And so those are all great places to kind of look for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So tell us um, what, how was it transitioning from being an in, being a recent graduate to, I'm sorry, let me roll that back. <laughs> How was it starting your new job as a new attending? You know, Sheena and I are about, we, I just hit my second year. I think you are getting ready to hit your second year this week. Sheena, her next week. Yep. You've been for three years now. So how was it transitioning from being a resident to an attending? And I know you said you had really good colleagues around you. Were there any other resources you used to help navigate you through your first year? Yeah, so it was a steep learning curve. Uh, regardless, just because being on your own, I mean, balancing confidence with competence, I think was tough. 
um, especially when you're trying to build that trust level with not just your patients, but also with the, the staff, therapists, nurses, um, also your medicine colleagues. Because in my system, in our hospital system, I we worked as consultants. And so um, kind of knowing how to balance the consultant role versus knowing when you know to leave things to the medicine team. I think that took a little time to get used to. Um, luckily though, I mean, with, with Warm Springs, I was actually, I mean, as residents, we get exposed to being in Warm Springs. So we do a rotation there. And so I think um, our residents in our program actually get some of that practice um, right off the bat. And so we, I, so I had that coming in and that was nice, but still being on your own and, and still making sure that, you know, you don't look like a complete fool <laughs> um, was really tough, I think, in the beginning. But having supportive colleagues, like I was saying before, was really helpful. I would frequently call, um, I would call Franco, I'd call Dennis, and I would just tell them, hey, I'm, I'm reviewing a case. I'm a little bit um, confused on whether or not I should accept this case. And we would just talk through things. And I think that really helped me get comfortable with you know, saying yes or saying no or justifying what I had to um, to the administration team or something like that um, when, when it came down to it. Um, also, just really maintaining a relationship with the medicine team because, you know, they're very important in the patient care. Um, and so I, you know, didn't want a helicopter. I, I wanted to make sure that I was providing, you know, the recommendation, the adequate recommendations for, for rehab um, but also making sure that they were medically managed properly. Um, and so everybody's threshold is different. Coming into this job, I think as a new graduate, um, new attending, um, we get very anxious. We're treating really ourselves and the patients sometimes, if that makes sense. Um, I think that I sometimes was overly cautious and maybe overly do things. And I think that certain, you know, some of the medicine colleagues have been in the field and been in practice for tens, 20 years before I have. And so their threshold is very, very different, you know, in terms of, okay, I think this patient needs to be sent out versus they just will just manage it there. Um, and so learning that in the beginning was also very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was a good experience because then I started to get more comfortable with, okay, what acuity level would I be comfortable with managing? Um, and then also just, you know, being in the consultant role, I think, one of the biggest things, at least when I was a resident rotating at that hospital, was understanding my role um, and understanding what I was really doing. Because it felt like, well, if the medicine team is managing high blood pressure and diabetes and all this other stuff that you know I'm not doing, what am I really, what am I really doing? Um, and so, not underestimating the patient's comorbidities in their particular situations with how that fits into therapies was also really important because, yeah, if you have a patient with CHF with a low ejection fraction, are they going to be able to tolerate the 15 hours of you know, therapies a week um, across five days, or do you have to modify that across seven days? Do you have to avoid back-to-back -back therapies? Do you have to put on heart rate parameters to make sure that we're monitoring that during um, you know, PT and OT sessions, things like that, that I think I kind of picked up much more as, you know, an attending versus a resident. Um, and also, this is unique to our hospital system, but it was a complete paper chart system. <laughs> so getting used to that was, I think, um, or getting into the routine of that was really tough, I think, for me, because just um, getting dictations in and, you know, writing orders every day and making sure that the orders are actually being seen um, because they're processed manually. Um, I think that was also challenging and understanding communication is key <laughs> um, with the nurses, developing a relationship with them, making sure they're seeing what you're writing and that they're understanding your, your handwriting <laughs> as well. So all of that was part of the learning curve. But again, because I had exposure to that in residency, it was, it was helpful. Um, and this is your first job, I think. For me, it was my first job. Um, you know, we've been in training, been in school for so long. I've really never had like a, a real job per se. So being the first job, uh, I think in residency, we're used to rotations, right? You're used to every four weeks. You know, we, we get used to a rotation at the end of the rotation and then we have to switch. And then it's like, okay, all right, let's start this again. 
but there was always sort of that light that, you know, you did this rotation, even if you didn't like it for, you know, the, the duration of it, you got used to it. And then you felt like, okay, there was an end. And then I could move on to something new next month. You don't really have that in your first job. This is your <laughs> lifelong rotation, so to speak, right? Unless if you decide to change out of that job, which is what I'm doing. But um, so that long-term rotation, I think of, of, of the job um, is, can make things a little bit dull sometimes. I think it could be hard to keep things interesting and keep things challenging once you develop that routine. Um, and for me, I think that was something that I was kind of looking for something a little bit different um, in order to, to really you know, practice what I, I really, really enjoy. Um, and so being in an inpatient setting, getting to see all the different kinds of patient populations was really nice because it really helped me see, okay, there were certain patients that I really enjoy taking care of. Like I really still like brain injury. I still like, you know, managing stroke rehab patients. Um, and then there are some more complicated patients that I just, you know, had a harder time um, managing them or just I felt like, you know, my efforts weren't as, as great or something like that. And so, you know, it was nice to kind of see how I fit in with all those different things, uh, all those different uh, disciplines um, while I'm on my own as an attending. Um, also keeping up with knowledge. So that was tough, right? Because in residency, you have a curriculum. You've got didactics, you have things built in. Um, you know you're supposed to read. Uh, you have certain faculty that, you know, will make you read if you don't. And, you know, th there is an expectation. Um, once you're on your own, that's, de that's dependent on you now. And so I think really kind of keeping up with CME once, you know, it's appropriate to do so. Um, I think what I did was just read for my patients. So if there were cases that were very strange mm -hmm. that I have not seen as much um, or it didn't feel as comfortable, um, I would just read for them um, because that was my way to educate them and also know how to, how to help them the best way. Um, I actually kept my subscription with uh, up to date. I really like that. You never know when that. I always just frequently pull it up on <laughs> any time. I think that's a really crucial <laughs> subscription to keep going. And and luckily, uh, my employer was able to provide for that as part of our CME. Um, but yeah, and I, I think the biggest thing that I also learned was just sometimes admitting that you don't know. Um, I think that was tough. Um, that still is something I'm trying to learn because you, I mean, it's not possible to know everything, um, even after residency. Um, and so when you're in that position of you're supposed to know everything because the patients look up to you in that position, um, and you have therapists and nurses who just know you as the doctor, um, sometimes you have to be honest with what it is that you don't know in order to give them the best possible care and the best possible answer. Um, but I will say being in an inpatient setting, it was wonderful to have some flexibility. So as a resident, you know, you really basically worked on a schedule based on your attending, right? Or whatever the rotation schedule was, but in an inpatient setting, and Benicia, I'm sure you are familiar with this a little bit. Um, basically you could decide when you go into work and when you're pretty much done. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of flexibility. Like you could say, you could go in and round at 6 a.m., um, see all your patients, be done with your notes. Um, and then if any new admissions come in early in the afternoon, see them real quick, but then you'd be pretty much done with your day. Um, and as a consultant, like I said, you know, you don't really get haggled with a lot of the acute issues that some uh, the medicine teams will, because, you know, the nurses will call them first. So that's kind of nice. You could really learn to kind of balance your work life um, a little bit more. So that was that was definitely a positive. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was it was tough. I mean, I, I still think I'm in training sometimes. <laughs> um, and we should have that mindset. <laughs> yeah, I think we should have that I mindset. Think, if you think that you know everything. And that's where you get in trouble. If you are too overconfident coming out of fellowship or residency, you know, you'll, you'll start, yeah. you'll learn soon enough that that's, that's not the mindset to have. You should be, right. you know, medicine's a lifelong learning career. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, I will have to give a shout out to the Facebook women physiatrist group. I live off of that. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how many times 
Um, I just go on that website to see what other people have to say and see what questions people have. And it's just we amazing. We for that, right? <laughs> I don't know. We should. I, don't think. <laughs> I use that. I frequently just go on. That's probably the only reason I use Facebook sometimes. It's just to go on that group and learn <laughs> or ask questions. And it's amazing. If we don't know, we'll tell Omar and he gets so jealous. We're like, we'll ask the women's Facebook. Yeah. Group. Don't oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The same. My uh, two PMR colleagues at work are both male, and they're like, "This is not fair that you guys have this." <laughs> but it is a great resource, Very and dumb. you know, we had um, John, Dr. Uh, Reisman. He's a, a resident over at in Minnesota, and he had started this new kind of uh, foam med free open access medical education. Um, wow. So on Twitter, and he, there's a website there. So lots of good places to kind of get um, resources and ask questions mm -hmm. and stuff. So. Um, Carol, so you brought some great points up, um, but let's kind of specifically talk about, you know, this, uh, we'll touch on Brian's question as well, where he asked, you know, was the position you were in academic or community-based, and then mm -hmm. why did you choose this practice setting? So where you work, you know, was basically a freestanding, private, inpatient rehab, you know, facility, right? So what were some of the challenges you faced, you know, that directly correlated with, you know, working in a private inpatient rehab hospital? Yeah, so it was a community hospital, um, freestanding, like you said. Um, we did have residents. Um, I, I didn't work directly with them, um, but we have, in the San Antonio area, we have three hospitals. And um, in the medical center, one um, is where our Utesca residents would rotate in. And so they would go, they, they, there's one attending that, that supervises them. And so that's the rotation that you would do in your third or fourth year as part of your inpatient training. Um, so I chose this hospital system because one, I was familiar with it. And two, um, being in San Antonio um, at the time when I was looking for inpatient positions, this one was open and there was another position open at Baptist and that was pretty much it at the time. And so I wanting, wanting to do inpatient, um, I, I wanted to come out to a community setting because I felt like I really wanted to challenge myself a little bit more um, in this setting because being in residency, being in that academic setting, I wanted to kind of get out of that a little bit and see what I could learn in the community setting. And maybe if any time in the future I were to come back to the academic community, I could bring that knowledge in. Um, so I, you know, overall really felt like our program was pretty rigorous and prepared us well for this setting, but there were challenges. So first I think, um, knowing your resources. So being in a freestanding, being in a community hospital, um, you have to know when it is appropriate. You can't just order any labs and imaging you want. Um, I think as a resident, we over order. We like to work patients up because that's part of our learning, um, but that's not cost effective. Um, so uh, a lot of the times, you know, if somebody comes in with back pain and ridiculous symptoms and you just know that an x-ray is not enough and you just want to get an MRI to see um, and then maybe properly refer them to a neurosurgeon or you know uh, even a non-interventional pain specialist um, that's not always covered because if that's not really something that is actively um, interfering with the current level of function that they're being admitted for it's not it's an extra cost and so you have to sort of take stuff like that into consideration um, when you're managing patients who are admitted to um, our hospital system like that. Um, also just knowing um, that you may not be able to do some procedures that you were trained to do in residency. So, um, I mean, joint injections, peripheral joint injections, I've done some sometimes, but they're not frequently reimbursed. Um, in an inpatient setting. And so there's not a lot of reasons uh, or incentive, I guess, per se, to do it, especially if it's not something that, um, you know, you think will actually ha help the patient that much um, right off the bat. Um, I think sometimes the um, procedures can also be difficult to do in some of these sicker patients. They come in with sepsis or infection. I usually just don't even consider that. Um, also patients with migraines, you know, you're trained to do Botox injections. It's very virtually impossible to do that in a uh, private uh, community freestanding hospital um, because it's just way too expensive. Um, 
and also I think we're used to certain types of non-formulary medications or um, creams that we like to use, topicals that we like to use for pain management sometimes. Um, and that's not available either. And so just kind of knowing what's available and what's not available, that can really change how you manage patients. Um, and then I think acuity was a big issue because you know we see a lot of patients who come to us from LTACs, from SNFs, from acute hospital, varying levels. And so a lot of the times they're a lot sicker than they can appear on paper. And then um, ultimately, you know, we have to decide whether or not they're truly appropriate for our level. And if we have to send them out to the hospital for stabilization, um, I, I was actually kind of a black cloud. <laughs> so I've had my fair share of codes um, and, you know, unfortunate, yeah, uh, deaths actually during my time there. Um, not a lot, but, you know, enough for me to remember that it was definitely something that even though as consultants, um, we don't always have to be, you know, in the, in the know of like all the specific medical details that a lot of these patients are, are dealing with because medicine teams are dealing with it. Um, you still can't be too comfortable depending on the medicine teams hundred percent because they're not always there. Um, and that's because a lot of these medicine attendings also round at other hospitals. So they oftentimes show up to the rehab hospitals at the end of the day or very, very early at the day um, before they go to the other acute hospitals. Um, so important to be, B, uh, you know, BLS and ACLS certified because you may have to run codes and things like that. Um, and, you know, we aren't the only rehab hospital in the community. So in the medical center, you know, we have the Baptist system, we have the Methodist system, we also have university. Um, and so a lot of the times the patients that we end up getting admitted um, may be patients that are kind of overflown from some of the other hospitals that weren't able to take them. Um, and I think in residency, we were very stringent about who was appropriate for rehab, right? I mean, we were very, I think we were privileged and we could afford that ability to say, well, this patient is too low functioning or too high functioning. I, I think there was very stringent rules about that, right? Um, and it, it really taught us what, you know, the Medicare rules are and the qualifying diagnoses were. And that was sort of ingrained into our system, into our minds. What um, was that but percentage? It, Sorry, Carol. What, the 60, what was that percentage? 40, the 60, 40, 60, 40, 60, 40 that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that Medicare comes up with where, you know, 60% uh, compliant you know. diagnosis. Exactly. Um, and what, can you, why don't you, can you explain that briefly to those who don't know what that means? Um, so basically, come, there are 13 compliant diagnoses that, um, you know, Medicare has deemed to be compliant um, in TBI, stroke, uh, spinal cord injury, amputees. Um, some, some of them are, I think, things like CAR, uh, CHF and um, COPD exacerbation are not qualifying mm -hmm. diagnosis. It's, it's really a, interesting. Yeah. I, we see so many more of those. So patients. much of it. Yeah. 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 Um, but and, and debility is not a qualifying diagnosis as well. Mm -hmm. You want to keep your inpatient unit at 60%. 60% uh, of your patients in that unit need to uh, fit into those qualifying diagnoses that Medicare has deemed, especially if they're Medicare patients. Yeah. And so uh, the non-Medicare patients, so commercial insurance, th those don't fit into that equation, that ratio. Um, but you have to have your unit kind of have that, that percentage of 60% of the Medicare patients have to have those qualifying diagnoses. And then the, 40, the, the rest of the unit can be debility or CHF, COPD exacerbation, other things um, that uh, don't cons are considered qualifying diagnoses um, in order to maintain that compliance um, and accreditation, basically. So. And, yeah, and if you don't, that can prompt a Medicare audit on your unit. Right, right. Dun, dun, dun. I know, and so there's a <laughs> lot of people that keep us on our toes in terms of, okay, uh, documentation. This is why in residency, that's why they, they really, really enforce how you document because that's how a lot of these coders and ERF, uh, you know, compliant liaisons pull um, these diagnoses so that they can basically say we're compliant or not compliant kind of thing. Um, and then there's also all these other comorbidities that you can add to your note, um, like tier one, tier two, that can add to the compliance. There's all these other details, but you learn all of that in your inpatient training. Um, and so you kind of have to take all of that into consideration. 
and you and and but like what I was going to say was that in in a like a in a community freestanding rehab hospital that I was in I felt like the patients that we then had to admit kind of were outside of that realm of what we thought was perfectly appropriate for rehab um and so I felt like I had to be a little bit more flexible and had to broaden that definition a little bit more, um, you know, getting patients from LTACs, from SNFs, from home even, that was always a challenging one because when pa patients come from home, your first question is, what is the medical justification for right. your admission? Um, and so understanding, so doing a little bit more workup for patients like that um, sometimes was necessary. Um, but you know, it, it forced me to be a little bit more creative. So things like, okay, so patients who typically are a little bit lower functioning, um, have lower ejection fractions from CHF or something like that, I would stretch out their therapies. I would make sure they don't have any back-to-back -back therapies where, you know, we're spreading their 15 hours across seven days. Sometimes I would just, I would do weekend therapies even, especially right before they're discharged, just to give them some, a little bit more boost. Um, definitely incorporate more family training um, if that's a possibility. Although in the pandemic, that was really challenging um, and, and not possible. Um, but, you know, I think it really made me ask the question of, okay, what, you know, other than looking you know, at all the different rules that we were taught in residency um, to say whether or not a patient was appropriate. You really just ask the basic question of, can this patient go home? And if they can't go home, can I help them get there? Um, I don't think that we have a perfect process um, anywhere yet. Um, and it's not always possible. I think that we're overly optimistic sometimes. I think we, we think that we can get them there but sometimes the reality is that, you know, they're just either not motivated or they don't, or the patients don't um, have the family support. That, that That's the most, I think, devastating thing is when we've done all the work on our end and the patients are, are wanting to be, be there with you, but they have no family support and they can't go home. And then that's it's heartbreaking. When, it is. And that's when you really then look to your case managers and just, you know, uh, show them a lot of respect because they are... <laughs> They are your angels in terms of helping. I always just, say case managers have the hardest job in the hospital. They will they have really to do miracles do. sometimes, yes. They really do. And yeah. I mean, we don't perform miracles, but I think they sometimes do. And yeah. um, the case managers also, unfortunately, aren't always social workers. And so I think mm -hmm. that sometimes when you have, you have to understand that and knowing that they also have their limitations um, and that can make a huge difference in how you ultimately dispo the patient. Um, but I think the most important thing is just to be respectful and be kind to everybody that you're working with. Um, that's, that's really the only thing you can do because I, I did find it pretty defeating sometimes when I couldn't get a patient home. When I accepted some of these patients from LTAX or from SNFs or from home that I felt like, wow, I, I didn't successfully rehab them home. That must mean that I failed as a rehab physician. Um, but I think the reality of it is that it's not black and white and um, that there are so many other factors that in residency, I think we don't, I think we're protected from. I think we see it, but we're protected from. And as an attending, when you're working kind of in a community with limited resources, you may not um, be able to achieve that perfect trajectory of recovery. Um, so, you know, we can only do the best we can. And I think most of the time with that intention, there is a positive outcome. <laughs> um, I otherwise I wouldn't be in this field true. anymore. Right. Yeah. No, it, it can be very, very, yeah. And we all very, come into rehab. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I think every one of us who decide on rehab or, or decide on PM and R, um, ultimately have sort of this positive light in our, you know, in our mentality. Yeah. Yeah. always want you know to 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 see people do the better best, yes. yeah and, and we, we we receive patients sort of kind of at the end of their you know a, after the medical stabilization and so it, it should it, it's we're supposed to wrap things up nicely and send them home but it doesn't always so, <laughs> I think that's where some of the burnout can come out you know can come from especially in our yes. group I'm sure we've seen some of the Surveys that show that PM and R has a higher burnout than other specialties because of some of the stuff that you mentioned and 
we haven't talked about it yet, but all the peer to peers, insurance denials and stuff for people coming yeah. into rehab. And, yeah. It is frustrating. Oh it, it is. It, yeah. And I think you brought up a very good point to those who are getting ready to interview for um, residency is to ask if you have exposure to academic versus community based inpatient rehab. Um, Cause I know we did. And I thought it was like completely different than being like at your home yeah. academic. And I was like, Oh, this yeah. is cool. I was like, I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I am doing some of it. So um, exactly. it, is, it is very different. Um, which I enjoy. Totally mm-hmm. agree. It's nice to have both of those. So definitely ask if you get that exposure to academic and community. Mm-hmm. And then I, I know there's some other questions. I wanted to also ask one other question to touch on that no one I probably wouldn't even think to ask um, okay. is, so, and I'll touch on it as well. Um, and inpatient rehab, you're a consultant, which I think is really cool. So you can okay. be a consultant for inpatient rehab or you can be um, the primary. So with mm-hmm. the inpatient rehab we run, we are the primaries, but we have medicine consults on every single one of our patients, which we're very happy because I know in residency where Sheen and I train, medicine rarely consulted on any of our patients. So we were definitely the ones managing all the hypertension, the diabetes, the CHF, things I don't want to manage, but you will in residency. Um, So was that something you were looking for was to be the consultant or it just happened to work out like that? Actually, yes, because I felt like in that model, you were able to focus on rehab specific (laughs) issues because, you know, I don't, I mean, I felt like a lot of the medicine teams could manage pain okay but a lot of the times we had a different perspective about pain management. And yes, so, absolutely. Um, and also we, I mean, they ended up making sure that we were the ones managing pain in the difficult uh, pain populations anyway. So yeah. I think that was a good, that, that was definitely something that I could then focus on and not worry so much about, okay, what about the blood pressure? What about the blood sugars? What about, you know, right. all this stuff? you take that into consideration, of course, but um it's certainly something that you you can sort of set aside and say, okay, well, that is deferred to primary. My recommendations for pain is this. Um, also sleep, um, that's something that I managed frequently. Um, okay. I liked, you know, you know, a lot of those very bread and butter rehab cases, like, you know, the- The, the bowel, prostate, the bladder, the sleep, yes, yeah, yeah. Bowel, bladder, exactly. <laughs> <With all injuries. laughs> Skin. Um, yeah. <laughs> chair, all of that. So you, you can then really focus on that. And, and it was so much nicer, I think. Yeah, no, that's good. So I think the takeaway for those who are looking for jobs, that's something to definitely ask is, am I a consultant? Am I the primary? If you are yeah. the primary, does medicine come to this hospital? Because right, easy accessible. Yeah. yeah, easy access. Because sometimes you'll be at a freestanding hospital and medicine won't come it's hard to get consultants to the hospital so definitely ask mm-hmm. those questions when you are building um jobs yep. yeah great points and i and one of the big other cha- sorry one of the other challenges <laughs> that i had was um having surgeons so i we don't have we only have medicine uh specialty yeah. wide uh, i think we sometimes had a hematologist come um we don't have infectious disease and we definitely don't have any surgeons. And so like a lot of, we get a lot of vascular cases. And so, um, you know, necrotic wounds that come onto our floor that definitely, you know, are beyond Dopplers uh, or, you know, any ultrasound that, or anything we can do that ultimate or hyperbarics even it's, you know, straight up, they probably need an amputation. We have to send them back to the hospital. Um, and so knowing kind of what the consultants, if you're a consultant, knowing what the other specialties that are available in the hospital is, is also important because um, that changes, I think, how comfortable you would feel managing some of that, those cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yep. then making sure you have good relationships with those that don't yeah. come to the hospital so you can be like, okay, I'm going to send you a picture. I need you to yes. give me a sideline. What do you think? Do I need to send them to you right now? Or can this yeah. just wait till outpatient? So relationships are key. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. which is nice. Yeah. All right, we have a few questions from the audience. So Sierra asks, you talked a little bit, Carol, about um, the flexibility, you know, of your start time and kind of during your day. Yeah. So she wants you to, if you can, kind of just walk through your week in general. When do you arrive, leave? Did you work any weekends or were you on call? Yeah. Uh, so on a typical day, um, on average, I would have maybe 15 to 20 patients that's how many I would have. And I actually did have to, um, I would say starting from last year, from 
sometime in October until um, August of this year, I was at two hospitals. And so I had, you know, 10 to 12 patients at one, and then I would have another maybe 15 um, at the other hospital. And so total, I, you know, I was kind of trying to maintain anything below 25, really, um, so that I felt like I could still adequately manage them and with the commute. Um, try to get there, you know, I, therapies will get there around 8, 8.15. And so if you want to try to round on your patients and not have to look for them in the gym, you get there before. <laughs> um, I am unfortunately not a morning person. And so I'll be honest that I did not get there at six o'clock um, bright and early, um, like maybe some of my colleagues, but I will get there around uh, maybe 7.50, eight o'clock in the morning. And I'll see some of them still in bed, not started therapies yet. And if I catch them in, in the gym, that's another opportunity for me to see how they're doing with the therapies. And so I like that interaction because then during the daytime is when there's most action anyway. And so I have that conversation with the therapist. We can troubleshoot things together with the patient there um, rather than just me rounding independently from what the therapies are doing and then talking about it in IDT. Um, so I ran at one hospital. I actually uh, finished my orders, um, but, but wait on my dictations until after all of my rounds are done at both hospitals. And so um, dictations you can do remotely. Um, and now I think Medicare has removed the 24 hour uh, time limit for new admissions. So what I would do is I actually would first see all the new admissions that get there um, so that I could finish their dictation first before that uh, requirement was removed, but now they've removed that. So you don't have that 24 hour time limit now to see and finish dictation of the new patient that has arrived on the floor. Um, but I definitely prioritize new patients. Then I see follow up patients, write all of my orders, go to the second hospital, do the same thing, and then do all of my dictations after that. But I had like a little cheat sheet that I would write things down just to keep things um, in, you know, um, in order. And then I think around, that would take me until like noon, um, one or two. Um, and then I would try to wait around to see if there were any new admissions that would come in. Sometimes admissions for us um, don't arrive on the floor until after five. And so I would just wait to see them in the morning. Um, on the weekends, um, we had a group of four physicians, four, yeah, four physicians. So that meant that we were on call every four weekends. Um, and we, we did cover all three hospitals um, in the area. So that could be pretty challenging at times. Um, but then we were able to somehow change our schedule so that we could break it up a little bit, especially during the pandemic when we were expecting man, many more admissions because a lot of the inpatient uh, rehab units that were attached to the hospital were starting to develop, you know, they were trying to change their units into nice. acute levels. And so we were taking some of their patients too. Um, and so we, because of those new admissions, we kind of broke our team up having more frequent calls, but less coverage in the hospitals. Um, so that worked out okay, but you were just on call a lot more, but we just focused on admissions mostly, most of the time and any essential follow-ups. Um, so that's kind of how my schedule was, I, I would say, in like a regular week um, with, with call. So it was doable, I think. Um, but there were definitely heavy weeks um, or heavy weekends. I think for me, the heaviest weekend I've ever had on call was 22 admissions on one call. Um, that was on a Saturday and Sunday, three hospitals though. So mm -hmm. the, it can get up there, yeah. But doable, like I said. <laughs> And you're the attending, so you're not the resident, so you don't feel like you're working for free. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. You're not working for free. <laughs> right? So. Exactly. All right. <laughs> All right. Really so, point. Yeah. It, it is, you know, as a resident, when you're on call on the weekends and you're like, oh my gosh, I have 12 admissions or something, it's totally different when you're on your own. You know, yeah, you may be like, okay, but at least you're getting paid for it, right? Yes. Absolutely. Um, all right. So yes. Noel says, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you actually look at it you're like, oh, yes, that's what, yeah. that's, yes, that's <laughs> yeah. more money. <laughs> it's, that's the honest truth. I mean, it, it does right. help you get through those weekends. It is. 
Mm-hmm. All right. So Noel has a good question. So what do you do in situations when the census is low and you're receiving pressure from admin to admit someone that will likely not succeed in, in the facility? That's a, yeah, wow. That's a loaded question. Um, so I think when the census is low, the administrative pressure is definitely higher. Um, and I think that there are battles that you should fight and there are also battles you should not. Um, and I think I had to learn that um, during my three years with them. Um, and I think sometimes if there was, I think I'd be much more, this is this goes back to my whole definition of what, it, what is an appropriate rehab patient. I think my definition broadened and I became more lenient um, in certain situations to just try to find, is there something I can do to help this patient? Is this patient, can I somehow do something in an intensive rehab program to get them better functionally um, and be more independent? And if the answer was yes, and that it was clearly that, you know, they were medically stable as well, then I would take them. Um, If there was any question about whether or not they were medically unstable or that they were medically inadequately worked up, I would ask ask more questions. Um, And I think, you know, that's also part of the administrative relationship that I had to sort of uh, develop. Like I had to sort of teach them what I was looking for. So they understood my expectations um, because ultimately what I would tell them is I, if I really don't think a patient is appropriate, I would say, this is not safe. This setting is not safe for this patient. I do not think that we can actually help this patient. Um, I think they would probably need a higher level of care first before they come to us. A lot of the times that's how I would phrase it. Um, if I really felt like there was a patient that they were pushing on me that I didn't think was appropriate and that was very low functioning, um, that's what I would do. I would ask more questions. I would tell them sort of, you know, this is, these are the reasons why I don't see us succeeding um, with this patient. And then I would also say if there is um, a strong interest in still admitting this patient after everything that I've said, um, they know that they can always go to a second physician um, for a second opinion. Um, and so they, sometimes that, that has happened in the past. And when they do that, um, I think um, I've, had, I've had other physicians agree with me. And then that's when they kind of stop and understand, okay, we, we can't push this patient on. So I don't think that when it, when it came to highly, highly inappropriate cases, I think that, you know, we were able to be successful in convincing the administration that, you know, this is not appropriate. Um, But definitely when you have a low census and there's not really a lot going on, I think I get a little bit more lenient and I take more debility cases, for example, home admissions sometimes come through that way. Um, And, and, you know, it could be like, you know, dealing with back pain for many years and they've slowly declined in function. And that would be the reason why they then get admitted to us. Um, And then once I meet them, I find out they've been having bowel bladder issues. They've been having all these other pain issues that was never addressed properly. And I felt like I was able to contribute to their care in a much more different way and comprehensive way than they've ever experienced. So I, we did add to their love, their quality of life, I think in the end. Um, So bringing them in to kind of troubleshoot that was okay. That's a great way of looking at that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's hard. It's not easy, <laughs> especially low census. You, you do get nervous, um, yeah. but, but it helps when your administration team understands what appropriate rehab patients are. It also helps that. And then you train them a little bit too. So mm-hmm. it's a ongoing relationship. All right, Carol, we got a few minutes left. So I'm gonna do a couple of rapid fire questions and then All we'll right. wrap up here. So, okay. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> Uh, easy. Um, for most attendings, is it t- pretty typical that the census is about 25 patients a day? Depends on your hospital size. Um, mm-hmm. I would say for our hospital size, you know, um, we had 50 beds available. And so it depended on, it depends on your hospital size and it depends on your group size, your group physician. So if there are, you know, 50 beds in one hospital and there were three physicians you know, in the hospital, then yeah, you would divide accordingly and you may come out with that 15 to 20 ratio, but everybody's, every hospital is different. So I I would not say that's the average. Okay. 
And um, with your other colleagues there, did any of them also have time for an outpatient kind of practice? Did they follow up with their patients kind of after? So not in our, in our particular hospital system, no, we did not, but it was something that we had always been talking about. And definitely I think it would be helpful to have that. Yeah. And our system is like that. Dr. Neha Shaw is the primary inpatient rehab doctor and we round on them on the weekends for call and do the admissions during the week during our call week for her. But she mm -hmm. does have outpatient clinic um, about three or four mm -hmm. times a week and does mm -hmm. a lot of outpatient follow-ups. And I see a lot of patients from the inpatient rehab follow-ups as well. Yeah, it's nice to have that continuity, but we did not. I totally that. agree, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Brian, I think maybe we'll touch on this a little bit more in another talk, but he's asking about advice for residents on the job hunt in terms of salary versus RVU versus being an independent contractor. Can you just briefly talk about how, how, were, how was your compensation kind of set up? What kind of, was RVU it straight based. salary? RVU based, there, okay. There was a base salary, but then our productivity was built in with RVU based uh, formula. So, um, I mean, 15 to 20 average patients would get you to that base salary. And, and if you saw any more above that, then that was extra RVUs for you um, to bonus. So it was very fair, I thought. Well, good. I think we'll have a another talk on like contracts and kind of- We should. Yeah. 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 I think it's about that time, yeah. So Probably towards like the end of- September? Maybe like, like, yeah, just November. November. Cause October November? we're booked, right? So no, yeah, November yeah. time, November. probably get that set okay. up. Yeah. Okay, that'd be good. Cool, cool. All right, Benish, do you wanna- um, yes, so Dr. <laughs> Lee, if you were not a rehab doctor, what would you be? Yeah, so I, I thought about this question a little bit <laughs> when you sent me the outline. Um, I, you know, I'm a musician too. Um, I played piano and flute when I was growing up. So I guess if I were to be unrealistic for a moment and dreamt a little bit, I, and I wasn't in medicine, which I really can't imagine being in a field not science related, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I think I would be a musician. It's, I, I kind of like to, you know, use my right brain a little bit sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer, very good. Nice. She's Fine. a very talented musician. I seen oh. it firsthand so <laughs> right. all right well, carol dr lee thank you so much for joining us this was super fun to catch up and um yeah, sure. as always as our viewers know you know we'll have this video on our igtv it's already on our facebook live it'll stay on there and then we will uh, edit it on and put it on our youtube channel as well as a podcast on spotify and itunes so you can watch and listen in many different ways. And our IG takeovers are back. So keeping up with the theme at San Antonio, Dr. Lee's alma mater will be taking over on Tuesday. And then we'll have Baylor Houston on Thursday and Mount Sinai, New York City will take over on Friday. So we still have plenty of spots available. So let us know if your programs are interested. Yes, and join us next Sunday. We have, um, doc she's kind of a big deal. We have Dr. Monica Gutierrez joining us. She is the new chair at the UT South, ooh, UT San Antonio program. <laughs> UT San Antonio coming in strong this week. Um, yeah. Yes, um, and we'll talk about her. She's very active on Twitter. Um, talk about a little bit about social media and um, things to expect with the new coming interview season for new residents. Yep. So, uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you guys. You guys have a good one. Thank you so Bye. much for having me. <laughs> Bye.